I need political leadership to take responsibility. I need African financial services to start looking at how do we cross the border of the unknown and invest in digital startups. As bankers, you look at what is your credit history, what is your capital stock. How do you ask those questions to a tech startup? Their main stock is in their heads. Mm. <laughs> and their capital is in their laptop. Mm. How do they access credit in a normal way? Abnormal times require that financial markets also start doing abnormal things to finance the next drive of African growth. We are living in uncertain times. One of the main things that are going to hold us, keep a positive momentum, is how we ride out short-term uncertainties. As a country, for example, Kenya is grappling with the challenge. We drove the East African integration, but we have seen a steady erosion of Kenyan market share in the East African market. Okay, it may be interesting that we're now looking at possibilities of cross-border economic zones with Ethiopia. It's good to be innovative and look at new ideas. But I think going to new battlefields without trying to diagnose and understand the results of failed battlefields does not represent progress. You must ask yourself, what is it we didn't do right in the East African space that we want to correct when we go into a relationship with a country which still has an exchange control act? Many, they can take in money, but you cannot take money out without central bank permission. An area without a minimum wage law, many in labor-intensive manufacture, Kenya can never compete with Ethiopia. The average wage is less than one third of the minimum wage in Kenya. What is the comparative advantage that Kenya brings to such a zone? Or is it a shipment of made in Ethiopia into the Kenyan market? Those are challenges that are difficult, but they must be addressed politically. Yeah. What this country, I think, needs is a replenished engagement between public leaders and business leaders. An engagement which says we have a responsibility and an opportunity. An opportunity, you have the most industrious labor force in the neighborhood. You have people who don't, on average, look to government to fix, fix feeding for them. But they say, give me space to do it for myself. Mm -hmm. Build into that space a purposeful public action. Right. Lastly, but I think going to new battlefields without trying to diagnose and understand <laughs> the results of failed battlefields does not represent progress. You must ask yourself, what is it we didn't do right in the East African space that we want to correct when we go into a relationship with a country which still has an exchange control act? Many, they can take in money, but you cannot take money out without central bank permission. An area without a minimum wage law, many in labor-intensive manufacture, Kenya can never compete with Ethiopia. The average wage is less than one third of the minimum wage in Kenya. What is the comparative advantage that Kenya brings to such a zone? Or is it a shipment of made in Ethiopia into the Kenyan market? Those are challenges that are difficult, but they must be addressed politically. Yeah. What this country, I think, needs is a replenished engagement between public leaders and business leaders. An engagement which says we have a responsibility and an opportunity. An opportunity you have the most industrious labor force in the neighborhood. When it comes to the re-emergence of flows to emerging markets, Kenya needs to be in a stronger place to be able to say, we've put in place the reform, we've done everything that we need to to keep growth sustained, the outlook is clear. The economies that manage to do that will be the relative winners. The economies that fail to take advantage of those conditions and fail to go as rapidly as they should be going in reducing their fiscal deficits, reassuring on their debt profiles, may not be in a position to benefit from that renewed appetite for emerging markets and frontier markets when it eventually materializes. Africa contributes only 1%. Sub-Saharan Africa contributes only 1% to the global growth. If you look at purchasing power parity, it contributes 2%. Putting that into context, Asia contributes 63 to 64 percent. 
that's the dimension you've got to keep in mind. So that's a huge gap. That's a huge gap. Africa predominantly has been an exporter of commodities. Manufacturing has picked up, but it remains a pretty insignificant contributor to local economies. That's a fact. If you put that in, of which a quarter is non-functional. If you put that in a context of a country, Sub-Saharan Africa population is pretty close to a billion. If you compare it to a market like India, it's 1.3 billion. I'm not talking about the US or uh, China, I'm talking about India. It has an installed capacity of 360,000 megawatts. So you can, you can put again the comparison that is there. So a lot needs to be done in terms of bridging the infrastructure gap. Annual estimates of infrastructure investments in Africa are anywhere from 100 to 130 billion dollars, of which roughly 30 to 40 percent are only met. So the gap keeps widening every year. That's the current state. Now the question comes up is, we're talking about sustainable finance, we're talking about Africa. Why do we need to get it right? I think that's a, that's a very important question. Why do we need to get it right in Africa? If you start looking at just the service, surface area that you need to address from a global perspective, Africa accounts for the US, China, Europe, and India combined. So you're addressing a big part of the world. You're not addressing it in a small city state from where I come, Singapore. You're addressing it for a large part of the world. 